in a way still local development. Uh, yeah. And uh, today's particular focus will be the role of local actors to drive uh, smart green and digital development in rural areas. I am uh, Serafine uh, Pathos Vidal. I am responsible for the rural and territorial development uh, uh, projects, uh, horizon projects in, uh, in ADL, and I will be uh, facilitating the session. I know as well, some of you know uh, my colleague uh, uh, Enrique Nieto, uh, and many of you might know already that he just had a child. So he will be obviously doing more important things today, uh, but he's, he will be, uh, I will be helped and she uh, supported by uh, another of our colleagues, Leticia Barca, which will introduce herself in a, in a moment uh, uh, to, to facilitate some of the session. I, um, could I have, uh, could I colleagues, could I have uh, access of this, the slide, please? Because um, I, I would like, next slide, please. Yes, just, just a second. Yes, um, next. Yes, uh, yeah, that one, that one. So just to say, uh, the meeting is being recorded as you might have probably noticed. Uh, microphones, please, uh, off. Uh, in order to make it interactive, please rename yourself as uh, your organization, your name, as you prefer, so we can identify you. You can write comments and questions in the chat that uh, some of my colleagues will, will take uh, there will be a debate uh, session later uh, after the three speakers and the two commentators, and you can raise the hand at the time for that. And it's recommended, uh, as I am doing here, to use uh, headsets. Uh, next slide, please. Well, uh, we have uh, now at the moment uh, already 60 people, if I'm not mistaken, or it's actually 60 and growing. Uh, we have 200 registered, so hopefully we get around 100 uh, as a fair uh, uh, assessment. Uh, we have 30 countries represented. I counted them yesterday, so uh, I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, and we have, among ourselves, we have practitioners, we have uh, experts, project managers, uh, but also some uh, pan-European and national networks, as well as researchers and public authorities, and with a significant proportion of local action group uh, practitioners, which is, uh, which is uh, great. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Okay. Why are we doing this? And I'm just sorry, uh, I will not uh, bother you too long on this. And some of you have known this already because we believe ADL is an NGO. It's not a consultancy or it's a lobby or anything. It's an advocacy NGO who does a lot of research and dissemination and networking on local development. And why we are, why are we doing uh, this ELIF uh, format of uh, meetings is to actually to share experiences outside the projects that we do. So we are a bit more free to experiment things, to invite people, to bring people from projects we work with other projects that we don't work, but would like to uh, learn from, uh, with officials from the commission, with uh, from member states and so on. And this is an opportunity to actually discuss local innovation in a wide sense, because innovation is not just technology and, uh, and it's about essentially doing things differently. Uh, that is the approach we are, we're approaching uh, to this. Next slide, please. Uh, why we are focusing on this? Well, because that's the funding mission of the ADL, which is focusing on local development, community-led, place-based, uh, empowerment of people, rather than just technocratic solutions imposed from the top. There's a policy element coming from the national, regional, or European level, but ultimately the success of an area depends on the residents uh, themselves, and that's why uh, we want to use this ELIF uh, European Local Innovation Forum as a as a venue to exchange these things beyond what we do on a day to day basis. Next slide, please. So today, as many of these ELIF meetings, is about to provide a space that is informal, it's voluntary, it's online, so everybody from Europe, from thirty countries, uh, can join. It's also for future, uh, you know, think on the, about the future. Allows for peer learning, networking, in a way getting to know other people that we might not necessarily know uh, otherwise. Next slide. This is just to show uh, the typical thing we always put, uh, to show the diversity of EU-funded local development. We have ITI, CLLD, leader, leader with other funds, and also there's hundreds of other uh, local development initiatives that's not even, they are below the radar because they are um, 
not funded by the EU. So, you know, there's a lot of things we can learn from, and there's not enough of that exchange happening at the moment. And Elif would like to help uh, fill in that gap. Next slide, please. Also because, uh, as you can imagine, there is a lot of uh, rules and policies set from the top that sometimes they make no sense. And identifying that and trying to find innovative approaches is uh, the purpose of these uh, meetings and in a way what the ADL does. Next slide, please. Why are we choosing today's session? Well, because we believe that uh, there is an opportunity to discuss local uh, development from the point of view of smart, from the point of view of digital, from the point of view of green. And that's why we are having a number of uh, speakers, which I will introduce right now, uh, to will basically provide their different perspectives. So we see what's different, what is not, uh, and, um, and, and trying to find some conclusions together. Next slide, please. So today we'll try to, as I say, to provide an overview of very good best practices, smart green and digital development, identify gaps and opportunities, and more generally debate how community-led innovation could be supported or is being supported in Europe. Next slide. Very quickly, and I'm just already going to, we was ready to give the, the, the floor to the real uh, protagonists of today. Uh, we will have uh, Daniela Gianantonio uh, from uh, FAO, uh, who will be presented for the first time ever in public, the readiness assessment tool for digital uh, vigil villages. It's a project that Pan-European project has been uh, carried out uh, uh, over the last uh, year and is a tool to actually help uh, communities to identify how to actually be smart. Uh, and I'm very glad that we have that here. Then we will have uh, Jorge Kalejek, a founder of a Smart uh, Solid Seed Project, who will discuss uh, intelligent rural territories, as he will be speaking in a moment. And then just to finalize this slot, we will have smart development in the green transition, uh, which is essentially a practitioner from the ground, uh, from Romania, from a farm, from Dusha Virjala, uh, from Gardenia Urciae in Romania, and also a member of Ecolis, of which we are grateful that uh, could collaborate with us in this uh, meeting. Uh, next slide. Then we'll be having uh, Gianluca Brunori, which is well known to many of us, coordinator of a number of rural digitalization projects, the CIRA Codex. Emma O'Hara, which is the founder of uh, Ecolis, and also Mauricio O'Brien from uh, European Crowdfunding Network, who will be basically commenting on uh, the first three presentations, will facilitate by my colleague Leticia, and there will be a debate uh, for all of you to contribute. And I think that's uh, more than enough for, for the first uh, for introduction. So um, I think we can just go ahead with, um, next slide, please. Uh, with the three speakers, we will start with Daniela, then with Jorge, and then with Brandusian. Uh, maybe, Daniela, uh, you can start. And colleagues, could you actually have next slide, please? Thank you very much, Seraphine, and uh, good morning to all of you. Thank you very much for inviting me to join this event and to tell you about FAO's Digital Villages and the DVI Readiness Assessment Tool. So let's go to the next slide. Um, Actually, before we begin, let me just spend a few words on FAO for those of you that are not familiar with it. Um, as, uh, as you said, I'm, I'm new to these events. So FAO is the Food and Agriculture Organization and a specialized agency for the United Nations that leads international efforts to defeat hunger. Our vision is for a world where agriculture contributes to improving the living standards of all, and especially the poorest, the most vulnerable ones, in an economically, but also socially and environmentally sustainable manner. We work in over 130 countries worldwide across five key geographies, five key regions, and my role as the team leader for digital agriculture is specific to the regions of Europe and Central Asia, meaning that we work in 18 countries across Eastern Europe, Western Balkans, Turkey, Caucasus, and Central Asia. As you have understood, digital agriculture is really an important priority area for FAO, as we see technology as a key accelerator to development, and so also an important driver to local development, of course. And to harness 
the potential of technologies for rural development in a positive and sustainable manner, we launched a corporate flag flagship initiative that is called Digital Villages. Next slide. So Digital Villages is a corporate program that FAO has launched to respond to the multiple challenges that are affecting rural areas. And uh, the initiative presents many, many commonalities with smart villages, but there is a slightly stronger focus on the development of the agriculture sector and on digital innovation. In fact, we believe that technology can be really this incredible accelerator to close the multiple divides that rural areas face. Um, digital villages that we also call in a shorter way DVI focuses on three main areas, three key dimensions. The first one is agricultural production. So it focuses on improving agricultural productivity by stimulating the uptake of various technological solutions, which could be sensors, internet of things, geospatial technologies, agro-robotics, uh, drones, you name it. So all solutions that can help make farming more precise, automated, but, and obviously, environmentally sustainable and green. The second dimension is farmers' access to digital services. Why? Of course, traditional ICTs such as TV, radio, but especially digital technologies are offering us such an incredible opportunity to deliver knowledge, information, and advisory services to farmers, overcoming the special barriers that are brought by isolation. So the last dimension takes the perspective of the overall village and address the overall community needs. So it focuses on stimulating local innovation and co-creation. Last year, we started a really fascinating journey to develop a conceptual approach and to implement pilots to bring digital villages to our region of Europe and Central Asia. And to do so, we partner with Edel to leverage the overall insights and the lessons learned from smart villages of the European Union. And so thanks to Edel's experts, we studied several cases of European smart villages and we developed a set of conceptual and methodological tools. Um, in next slide, you, you can see uh, our vision, our vision for digital villages in the region that is to empower really every village and rural community in Europe and Central Asia to build on their local strengths and to harness the potential of digital technologies, but also grassroots innovations, knowledge, partnerships, so to transform into villages, into rural communities that are people-centric, that are smart, that are green, that are connected and also interconnected. Um, next slide. As I said, partnership with Edel was really critical to help us develop a set of methodological tools, such as this step-by-step -step approach to DVI implementation, but also a methodology for twinning and the DVI readiness assessment tool, which I'm here today to specifically tell you about. So what is the DVI readiness assessment tool? It's a methodology to help us select rural community that the rural communities that will receive FIO's technical and financial assistance. But this is actually a tool that could be used by any actor, local actors too, and anywhere in the world because it is developed in a um, very geographical agnostic manner. Um, to self-assess or to assess a village's strengths, needs, local assets, weaknesses, and opportunities, and to evaluate the overall readiness of a village of a rural community to engage in a digital or smart village transformation process. In our perspective, the tool can help also prepare to the next steps of this digital or smart um, village transformation process. 
namely the design of the village strategy, which we called the DBI roadmap, and um, that leverages the village strengths, uh, address the needs, and set the way forward for the implementation of DBI interventions. So let's now delve into the tool uh, in, the, in the next slide. So the tool is based on 17 criteria across three dimensions. The first dimension is the digital ecosystem, because in DBI there is a stronger focus on digital development, but also the leadership and governance and the strategic context. Yes, of course, because without people able to live and to drive the transformation process and without endogenous resources to leverage, no digital transition could ever take place, right? So each of the 17 criteria questions must be answered both in a quantitative with a score from one to five and in a qualitative manner. And the total quantitative scores uh, score determines the overall readiness level. But the qualitative score, the qualitative assessment provides really critical elements that would otherwise be impossible to grasp. So, for example, and I'm going to keep using these examples throughout this presentation to help you, you know, understand our journey. When we asked to village not of Kent in Uzbekistan, the first two questions, how is the level of uh, um, mobile internet connectivity and fixed internet connectivity. You know, they told us oh, mobile connectivity is, is, is very good, put us at four, and uh, but fixed, not very good. Let's put it at two. Okay, but why? So actually, there is a problem with electricity that was important to understand. Or when we ask the same questions to village Lorazor in Tajikistan in a super beautiful area, um, so the answer that we got is that, oh, it's very low, um, both mobile and fixed, but what we are doing is collecting signatures from villagers so that we will apply to mobile network operators and to the national communication agencies so that they will help improve the antennas. And actually, few weeks after I was in Tajikistan, they wrote me an email that they got 200 signatures and a clear commitment from the National Communication Agency to, to improve the level of connectivity. So this, just to tell you, this was a very important qualitative element that would have been impossible to grasp otherwise, and that also informed us about other important questions and other important elements, such as the ability of a community to act and to react to the local challenges. So let's go to next slide. First, I mentioned digital ecosystem, and let's go quickly through some of the criteria, some of the indicators. So under digital ecosystem, um, we assess the level of digital infrastructure, as I just explained, mobile and fixed network, but also digital penetration. For example, in North Kent village of Uzbekistan, both women and men will own smartphones, but this will not be the case of other villages located in the same valley, Fergana Valley of Uzbekistan, where uh, women in other villages, because of social norms, just cannot own a smartphone. So this was a key factor to consider. And it is also critical under this dimension to assess the level of digital capacities. So. The, the, the presence and the presence of digital stakeholders, whether they are startups, business incubators, universities, and so on. Next slide and next dimension is the leadership and governance. So here we look really at the human capital, and this is a very interesting concept, right? We look at the absorptive capacity of a community, so their ability to learn and their openness to innovate but also the ability to act and react to local challenges, such as the example I just mentioned about Tajikistan and about the village of Lorazor, that they have collected 200 signatures because they wanted to improve the level of connectivity and they just didn't want to sit and wait for that. In this dimension, we also look at governance. So would public administration be supportive? And would there be other actors that are able to support such transformation 
the process. This is essential to ensure sustainability. And we look at the ship. So are there leading figures? And here also I have a very interesting example to bring from Uzbekistan, because by looking into, into this, we understood that in the village of Kent of Uzbekistan, for example, there is a very strong social and leadership structure. There is the head of the village called Akin. There is an assistant of the head. And then there are heads. Heads for women, heads for youth, heads for farmers, and heads for each street. So there are already these very uh, structured leading figures. And then there are the old savvy people from the village called Oshakol that play a very important role as leaders and as trusted advisors. And I could never forget after a meeting I had with uh, you know, the key leaders and other people with the community um, was closing such a meeting you know, to understand the interests of the community to engage in the digital village process. And the OSHA call at the end in perfect English says something like that um, they understand that digitalization holds enormous potential and that they are so ready to harness such power and that they just need knowledge and capacities and then they, they will just take it further. So th this was incredible, incredible example of a village with a very strong leadership and very strong social structure where, that we can build on. Next slide uh, is the strategic context. So the third dimension. Here we look at the endogenous resources. What are the local assets that we can leverage? So, for example, in village Lorazori in Tajikistan, you know, amazing landscapes. Uh, really looks seems like being in Tuscany, uh, but there is absolutely no tourism developed there. There is awesome weather. It's cooler in summer. There is a very special type of grape called toifi and a very special type of. Um, of the old breed that gives really delicious meat. So we want to mm -hmm. leverage such endogenous resources, right? In, in, a, in such a transformation process. But there also needs to be a strategic fit with the overall strategies and economic and financial resources or the ability to mobilize them to ensure sustainability. Next slide. Um, so as I said, Within the readiness assessment tool, each criteria is given a score from one to five, which determines the final readiness score and the stage of maturity from seed to sprouting to growing and blossoming. Seed and sprouting villages are typically underdeveloped, both from the point of view of infrastructure, especially in seeds, as well as people's readiness and proactiveness to engage in, in, a, in a transformation process. So we consider them for other kinds of intervention, whereas when a village is uh, scores as uh, grow, grow, uh, growing or sprouting, um, sorry, growing or blossoming, it can be considered as a better recipient of DVI, as the enabling conditions, the enabling environment is there, and our support could just help better catalyze the existing potential. Next slide, I'll go quicker, but perhaps there will be chance to expand on this during the Q&A. This was just the example of the final readiness assessment score in North Kent village of Uzbekistan. Um, so as I said, digital ecosystem quite underdeveloped due to the several internet challenges, but the people living there, and so the leadership and governance is just golden, is so strong, amazing, amazing resource to work with. And uh, yes, as you might have understood, we selected this village as a future digital village of FAO and first digital village in Uzbekistan. And readiness assessment tool was essential to then build on the next step. So the development of the DVI roadmap, the strategy for the village, and also the implementation of several interventions. And perhaps we'll expand later or in next meeting. So next slide, just to tell you that uh, uh, we use the tool to assess more than 30 villages in just one year across seven countries, the ones that you see on the slide. And uh, uh, yes, we believe that the tool cannot just be used by 
uh, by us or by development actors such as FAO, but could really be used also by local actors themselves to self-assess their readiness to identify their strengths and their areas for improvements and uh, to develop strategies and interventions based on the results of the assessment. And let me just conclude by saying that um, it is much better that you try it out to understand it. So if you uh, get your mobile phone and um, uh, scan the QR code that you see on the slide, or if you use the link that you see on the slide, and now I will post it also in the chat, you can have a sneak peek into the readiness assessment tool, a simplified version just with the, with the quantitative scores. And uh, so you can take it, you can have a look and once you get it to the end, if you like, you can insert your email and receive the results of the assessment and some methodological notes to your inbox. And next slide, actually very soon, we will make it available on our website. So save this link, um, pow.org, Digital Villages Initiative Europe uh, to, to also keep updated about uh, our work with digital villages in Europe and Central Asia, and also to get to know, uh, next slide, when our publication, our joint publication with ADEL will be published, which will happen very soon. We are, in fact, preparing for the launch of um, uh, this publication that will include the, the full readiness assessment uh, with the um, broad explanation on its methodologies, examples of application, and also the other methodological tools that we developed with ADEL, such as an approach for DVI twinning and the step-by-step -step approach to digital and smart villages implementation. So thank you very much. And uh, yes, looking forward to answering your questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. And I uh, appreciate that uh, the work has been put on this and the flexibility to present it today, because I know there's a lot of work still uh, going on. So, so thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And also remind us the importance of the context and going beyond Europe, the European Union, and these interesting things that we learn uh, from uh, those uh, those nearby, nearby countries that it's interesting to share and compare with what we do within the context of the European Union. Without further ado, uh, I would like to, to give the floor to uh, uh, to Javier Calella from Sweet Project from Spain. So we move from the pan-European level to a country. Uh, Jorge, welcome. He's a well-known uh, colleague of, of many of us in Adel and others. has uh, been uh, very much uh, in the driving seat of bringing uh, smart uh, territorial innovation uh, in Spain, but also uh, working in other countries too. I would like to actually provide some reflections about what it makes a smart territory, what are the preconditions uh, for that uh, to happen in the Spanish context, but I believe that could be also for other useful for other countries too. So without further ado, uh, Jorge, I think you can share your screen and uh, do the PowerPoint as you requested. So, Jorge, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you already. Uh, for having this uh, possibility of uh, yeah I think it's shared now can you see it uh, not yet uh, that's the problem of sharing that's on, okay there you are it takes a while to sometimes now, to act yes yeah, slowly <laughs> just go ahead yes so thank you very much for having this opportunity of uh, presenting our um, territorial rural intelligent model. So we we like to to speak about uh, territory, not only about single uh, villages, but uh, what what does it mean rural development? So asking to ChatGPT, uh, he says that it's the process of improving the uh, social, economic, and environmental conditions, but also enhancing the quality of life for rural communities. And this uh, word, quality of life, is uh, quite important for, for, for us. It's at the heart of, of our um, uh, proposal of uh, smart uh, rural. But uh, what's quality of life? Quality of life, it's about satisfying the essential social needs in a range of proximity of our homes. 
So uh, it's not only to have a work, is to have to have a job, is to have a job in the, in the in the proximity of our home. So it's about this uh, this concept of uh, satisfaction distance to the essential social needs, social functions that are work, learn, taking care of us, the resting infrastructure, so culture, sportive, possibility to move, possibility to stock up, uh, to get services and products in the nearby. So uh, this is the idea of Carlos Moreno of the of the 15 minute city applied to the to the rural areas. And it gives uh, the possibility to have a, a, a real holistic view of the development so that any any action uh, may be clearly focused on the goal of, of quality of life. So it's not technology, but it's technology for the quality of life. It's not um, providing a marketplace, but a marketplace to enhance the quality of life. So it's to have this vision of any action, we have to evaluate uh, it uh, in the sense uh, of it, it enhance or not the quality of life of the territory. Uh, quality of life also explains the process of depopulation because people move toward places where they find a balance in, the, in this uh, satisfaction distance to the, to the ensemble of the social functions, of the social needs. And it also shows the, the, the path to, to, to solve this big problem that we have in Spain. So it's not, the question is to provide, to, to shorten this uh, satisfaction distance. It also uh, shows or establishes the, the basic unit of rural development, and it's not the village, it's the rural area. It's this rural area with a similar identity uh, where the, the weakness of one village is, uh, is uh, relies on the, on the, on the, on the strength of, of other village. So it's not possible to, to think in rural development thinking only about one single village. And it indicates an operational objective that we can name as the 2020 rural areas in which the satisfaction distance to this ensemble of social functions is uh, under 20 or 30 kilometers or, or minutes. And it gives a sight of uh, this uh, assessment of, of quality of life in a rural area. But uh, there are two things that they are very important in this uh, in, in this uh, approach. So it shows the potential of digitalization, because digitalization can offer new services, but uh, overall it uh, reduces the, the satisfaction distance for the ensemble to the essential for the essential social functions. So we can we can work in our home in the rural area. And we can uh, have access to the commerce uh, in the rural areas and, and so on. So it's a real enormous the potential of digitalization. And it shows also this approach, the essential role of the public administrations. Because in fact, <coughs> the private initiative in rural areas <coughs> uh, is, uh, <coughs> Uh, has to do with with um, with the local commerce, with uh, maybe with the tourism, with the livestock, agriculture, and forestry. But uh, private initiative has not. We have not uh, a, a minimum critical mass for the private initiative to lead the the, the development processes. So, is the, the 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 public administrations are the key actor in this uh, in the in the process of the of the development of rural areas. But that means. Uh, that they have also responsibility. Public administrations have the responsibility to foster private initiative, uh, not to replace, but to foster, uh, so that the private initiative uh, could take um, hands uh, the, the the leadership of the of the development process. So, uh, what's the territory? Territory rural intelligente. What, what's the model? It's about enhancing quality of life, but uh, promoting the local economy, promoting the entrepreneurship that is associated to the new market niches 
uh, generated by digitalization. And how can we do that? So uh, it's the model that we call uh, driving projects, motor projects, sorry, projectos motor, uh, and entrepreneurship scenarios. And we, we can have the example of the video assistance for the elderly. So it, uh, it, it's about uh, connecting by, by Zoom, as we are doing now, with the medical services, with the social services, with the dependency aid. That's, uh, is the, the next generation of, uh, of digital services for all the population, also in the urban and in rural areas. And already it uh, will be a, 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 good, uh, a good service, a, a good new generation of service, but we can go one step further. So we can make that this tablet that we will implement in the, in the homes of the elder people uh, becomes the, the, the showroom, the, the, the window for all the services that the local entrepreneurs and local enterprises and firms uh, can offer to this collective, is the, is the, the silver economy that is named. And, but uh, this idea of uh, driving um, projects and uh, entrepreneurship scenarios needs some basic infrastructures. The, the the first one is the is the brain. It needs a brain of uh, of the of the of the project, and the, the brain is what we call this innovation and entrepreneurship center. It, it it has the vision of what is possible, what technologies can offer in this uh, in this situation of this rural area, and it's the the is the human resources center uh, that takes the responsibility of uh, of promoting the the, the entrepreneurship. But we need also some um, physical infrastructures, uh, connectivity infrastructures. This is what we call the uh, smart management network that we can uh, implement, uh, for example, with the renewal of the, the street lighting. Uh, and we can, we can establish and implement a two layer, a Wi Fi layer for high bandwidth services or on, on one IoT layer for sensors networks in order to avoid digital exclusion. That is the big risk of the digitalization of the rural areas. And digital exclusion uh, can come from, from the economically vulnerable groups, in the areas without coverage of internet or users without internet at home, like the 50% of the elderly people in Spain. Another important uh, infrastructure is the, is the data uh, management infrastructure. So the, the smart uh, management platform to monitor the ensemble of digital services in order that all the data uh, stays locally and allows us to, uh, to analyze and to, 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 to think how to better the service we offer. And finally, the, maybe the most important uh, infrastructure is this training, communication, and social participation center that uh, provides the tools for these projects to, to go on. And so uh, we can summarize in these two axes of uh, our proposal of uh, a smart uh, rural uh, is uh, implementing the basic infrastructures of the digital transition of the rural development of the rural areas. So connectivity infrastructures to avoid the, the, the digital exclusion, the data infrastructure uh, to, to having access to the, to the data that the territory is producing, the innovation and entrepreneurship center as the brain of this uh, process of uh, digitalization and the communication uh, training and social participation center as the human resources uh, dedicated to this uh, yeah, to, 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 to ensure the, to provide the tools for, um, for ensure the success of the, of the, of the project. And uh, besides that, this, uh, this model of actuation in based on driving projects uh, that generates entrepreneurship scenarios in the four main areas of actuation of the rural uh, areas. So it's tourism, 
and local economy, uh, public services to the people, and environment. And always these uh, transversal elements, their inclusion and equality, decarbonization, and territorial balance. So I think that in 10 minutes, uh, I, I, I have been able to summarize uh, our proposal. And, uh, and I stay uh, looking forward to your, your comments on Whatever thank you, thank you, Jorge, and uh, that's very good. I mean, that I actually see some of the things you are being advocating now making it to Spanish policy, and hopefully in the Spanish U presidents, some of the things you've been putting forward will also be echo, as far as I understand that will be the case. <laughs> so, well, now we move from first the pan-European, then a more national approach if you want, and now with a very, very, very local. Uh, I'm very glad to have uh, with us uh, Brandusha Virhala. Sorry if my pronunciation of Romanian is not uh, excellent. Uh, she's, uh, she's a farmer, and you will see that perhaps from uh, her own farm in a moment. Uh, she's been involved in agroecological agri gardening. She's been uh, work if, we're working with the small uh, peasants, uh, uh, grassroots peasants associations in Romania, but also she has a international uh, profile as uh, she has uh, been dealing with environmental governance and working in uh, several countries including outside Europe so um, so I don't know if you do oh yes there you are so you have like wealth of experience very local very international and you're from the very real life not just beyond the seminars so please perhaps you can have some insights about what it means to be in practice uh, and to do green transition in practice in a very rural uh, community thank you go ahead please I hope so. Hello, everybody. My name is Brindusha Berhala, and uh, together with my daughter Laura, I will try to tell some um, interesting stories to me. Uh, one will be our personal story, and the second one of uh, our organization, um, uh, which is trying to implement community supported agriculture in Romania. Uh, I hope everything will work out because uh, we just had like a short power cut. <laughs> That's why I I um, got offline and now I'm back. So to, to start the journey, um, a bit about myself. I am um, uh, originally from Bucharest. And now, um, since 10 years now, I live together with my partner and now our daughter um, in the countryside of West Romania, so all the way <laughs> near Timișoara. So we are um, 35 kilometers away from a bigger town in Romania, bigger city, I would say. Um, and we took this choice uh, after graduating from uh, our master's. Um, we met in Belgium. I did an international master's in rural development there. Um, and previous to that, I did a master's in environmental governance, like it was uh, presented. Um, but all of, all of this <laughs> to um, build in us the impetus to move to a um, local community and to try to implement uh, things and to try to um, do it ourselves. Why did we come here out of all places? Uh, because there was an uh, eco-community initiative um, that started around 2000 and we were following them and admiring um, their story and um, yeah, we wanted to join forces and so we did in 2013 and we had um, for the first three years of our uh, being here um, we had um, some infrastructure like a community house that we could use and of course the social infrastructure but things developed quite quite fast since then in the sense of um, um, just to localize you, we are in the village of Stanchova. It's a um, multi-ethnic village, um, and the composition is uh, Serbian ethnics and Romanian ethnics, but now also with international, uh, a little international touch. My partner, Ansem, is um, from Belgium, and um, yeah, he's now... I think we have a reality check here uh, because we had a very good, uh, oh yes, maybe she's back. Maybe because, uh, you know, she, her, her brother was excellent a moment ago uh, and not anymore, but uh, that can happen even in urban setting as I know myself. I don't know if we can actually get uh, Dusha. 
if she's not joining uh, at the moment, what we can do is actually give her the floor in the debate uh, part in a moment. Uh, it was funny because she was getting on, on the, the actual story, she was getting interested. Uh, but uh, I think colleagues, I think we're just gonna move. I would also like to thank, apart from Dusha, who will hopefully join us in a, in a moment for the debate session. We'll also uh, thank colleagues for having some facilitated Dusha attendance today. Uh, we are having the first, this has been the first uh, best practices, two and a half so far anyway. We will see if we can get to Brandusha in a moment. Maybe we can actually go, as uh, we swing over the time, getting straight to the uh, commentaries. We have uh, three commentators, uh, Leticia uh, Abarca, my colleague, uh, will now take uh, this uh, facilitation of this session uh, and she will be uh, uh, taking the floor uh, now. So just leave it with her. Thank you. Thank you, Seraphim, for introducing me. I'm going to try to be brief so we can actually go with the with the stars of this part of the session. Oh, we got Bridusha back. Yes, I'm so sorry. It's uh, it's really bad luck with just very brief power cuts. So we have good internet, but uh, electricity is uh, not the best. I'm so sorry for that. No. Um, okay. Yes. Um, so in a nutshell, um, we started from zero. We were two uh, young uh, students that had all these ideals, but and all the uh, let's say uh, academic knowledge, um, but uh, very little budget. So um, at least we could afford a piece of land. We built our um, house here, ecological in an ecological way, and then we started the agriculture project. Um, I will try to share the screens to uh, share the screen. Oop, no, 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 no. Uh, it's preventing me. In any case, um, it doesn't work right now, but I identified a couple of um, opportunities and barriers. I'll just refer to these and um, then jump to the other story of the organization if there's still time. If not, I. I I will uh, meet you in the question and answer, hopefully. So our opportunities for being here and implementing our dream, let's say, have been um, the welcoming local community. So we had a social infrastructure to count on. We had also a physical infrastructure that was temporarily available to us. After we built this house, um, it became available to other people, basically. There was uh, back then affordable land prices. So at least they were in our... Uh, small budget range and that was quite a privilege to be able to find this piece of land where we are located. Um, the local and the global knowledge experience and experience to tap into, so the village community knowledge, the community of the people that had the Eco uh, Village Initiative were super valuable, but also the global in the sense that of course we learned a lot just by researching things and just um, uh, trying it out. Uh, we had a certain adventurous and frugal mindset, and this is important to set up and to to try to bring uh, young people uh, in this uh, rural context. The digital infrastructure is also an opportunity, um, but much uh, less the uh, yeah the um, utility, so to speak, um, are uh, a bit behind. Um, the existing rural networks at the national level, like it was mentioned, I um, got involved with the uh, National Peasants Organization and the Community Supported Agriculture Network to try to bring uh, our contribution to that. Um, there was existing initiatives for local producers that we could join forces with. Um, interest in natural building and ag agroecological food products um, by consumers, appropriate technology, uh, was available in this uh, Schumacher sense of the way, like small scale um, appropriate to the need technology that we we have been using from bicycles to yeah self made machinery and um, many <laughs> uh, many needs were fulfilled by appropriate technology. We feel. and there was not too much bureaucratic burden to set up an agroecological lifestyle. So the Strobel House. Um, we managed to do it legally, but without much, uh, very much hassle. The compost toilets and so on are um, tolerated, so to speak, still in the rural setting in Romania. Uh, the barriers or limits, uh, I call them limits in the sense that they are, they don't 
stop people, but they, they can be overcome in the right context and with the right um, luck, let's say, or, <laughs> or privilege, or I don't know, work, uh, you, you name it. Um, so the barriers can be a limited budget, um, farming um, gives you a small income, so it's not enough to invest uh, further in the agriculture project. Um, and um, proof to show uh, my partner is now off farm because he's, um, he's working, he started a new job and this brings him um, yeah, outside the country uh, now and then. Um, physical infrastructure limits, uh, for example, the house we live in is a very small frugal house that was great for us, but now the baby is a bit too small, so that's also something to keep in mind, um, how you set up. Not enough workforce, so indeed the agriculture project has been growing, we also have two hectares of uh, rented land and uh, a bit of orchard, plum orchard, uh, and we feel there's not enough workforce to um count on the loneliness factor <laughs> as you can see and time everything takes time um to happen um i would also put here let's say the slow adoption of the local community because we do things agroecologically but um, yeah not much of the um, so it's been well uh, taken by um people in our peasant network but much slower by the people here in the village who do things in 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 their own way so they they use um so, you know, synthetic inputs are still used in even in small scale farming unfortunately so this is also this is also a factor so just to conclude um it's a chicken and egg uh, situation um in which you need the uh, people uh, you need more young people in the countryside, in the rural context, but then the work and the economical aspects are not at all attractive <laughs> to bring these people um, in the rural context. So, um, yeah, we need more people. Uh, luckily, we managed to, um, we are now building a new space, a new living space. So soon we will make a call to uh, grow the community and to invite other people to come join us and to join forces uh, at this huge um, but very beautiful uh, dream. Um, the organization itself is in the same uh, constraints, like not enough people are um, at the moment. So it's waxing and waning the, the interest and the, the people that join uh, their energies and um, Yes, uh, I, I can respond to more later yeah, on. The organization is... Um, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As I said, this was a reality check, just the, the, the content and the performance. So we're just going to move out to having a bit of commentary with uh, the three commentators. So Leticia, your floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as I was saying, I'm going to be really brief uh, because we are a bit out of time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your inspiring speech. And just like super quick, it's going to be uh, one round of questions, and then we are going to have a small debate after that. Um, I'm going to give you Gianluca, Imon, and Mauricio around three, four minutes for responding to the question. And um, yeah, I'm going to present first. Uh, introduce you first and then we'll go with the questions. Uh, for those who don't know them, uh, we have here Gianluca Brunori. Gianluca is full professor uh, on food policy in the University of Pisa and he has more than 30 years experience in research in this area. Uh, we have also Imun O'Hara that is the co-founder of Ecolis, that is the European Network of Community-Led Innovation on Climate Change and Sustainability. And Imon is also a writer and has a vast experience on new policy and project management, always like more than 20 years related to local development. And finally, we have also Mauricio O'Brien, um, that is Regional Development Manager of the European Crowdfunding Network. Uh, but apart from that, Mauricio is also a rural and social innovator, innovator and also an entrepreneur. Thank you all for, for joining us to be, and, and to be here. And then I'm going to be super quick to the question because it's the important part. Uh, so I'm going to start with Gianluca. <clears throat> Thank you, Gianluca, again, for, for being here with us. Uh, I have 
like one main question that is what are your thoughts on this new and build digital village uh, readiness assessment tool and especially um, how does it compare uh, with uh, those tools and outcomes that you like we all work on the CIRA that is the rural digitalization project you just left uh, <laughs> thank you very much Leticia uh, I have to say that uh, this uh, this tool is uh, extremely useful uh, we have seen uh, during the zira that um, during our work with the living labs that uh, one main barrier uh, to the development of digital solutions is a uh, kind of digital readiness so the uh, something that relates to individual but also collective uh, uh um, capacity to uh to to, to uh, incorporate uh, digital solutions and i see that in this tool a lot of the issues that in this era were developed resonates so the issue of the digital ecosystem we have seen also jorg explaining how it is possible to build a digital ecosystem in in a region uh, the issue of the strategic context, but also the leadership and governance. And actually, we have found that this readiness is a key aspect for it. Uh, at the same time, I uh, always tend to say that on one side, we have the readiness, but at the same time, we need a tailored technologies so technologies that fit to the context and they are developed uh, together with uh, let's say with users and with stakeholders so on one side uh, digital readiness is also and it should be considered readiness to uh, talk with technology developers investors etc on how to shape digital solutions fit to the problem of the community. And on this regard, I think that the uh, whole uh, this policy of, of uh, uh, smart villages is uh, uh, really relies in the strategic capacity of the communities to identify their problems and uh, to provide the tailored solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gianluca, for your for your response. Uh, now uh, we are going to go with um, Imon Ohara. Imon, thank you very much for for joining us today. Uh, my question for you is like you know very well uh, the membership of Ecolis. Uh, so, to which extent do you? Mm, I mean, the things we heard from uh, Bladusha are comparable to other countries, and especially to Romania that suffered a rust, rather drastic economic transition in the recent years. Yeah, hi, Leticia. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I think what we heard from Bladusha is, is typical, to be honest. And what I, I guess what we're seeing is a, a growing movement of people like uh, Bladusha and her, her partner that are looking to do something different, looking for change and looking to build a different kind of, of food system, if you like, um, and often building on, when Dusha mentioned, she's part of the, the network of community supported agriculture, often building on, on networks that already exist uh, and have been in place for quite some time. And we see the CSA community supported agriculture movement is, exists right across Europe. Uh, along with many other movements, we have the slow food movement, we have the incredible edible movement, which started in the UK and is now growing. We have a movement of permaculture projects right across Europe, community gardens, which are expanding through, for example, the transition towns movement and, and other movements. And then we have a kind of a revival in, in farmers markets and in regenerative agriculture. And all of these movements are being I would say kind of revitalized in some way by this kind of upward interest and, and kind of uh, energy for change in the system. Um, but I think what's happening and, and Brindusha pointed this out as well is that 
this kind of new system that's very much about local, ecological, uh, small scale is, is pushing against uh, an incumbent system that's very deeply established. Um, and I think that makes it difficult sometimes to, to uh, build and, and kind of uh, sustain the, the kind of smaller scale activities that we're seeing. And I think one one of the problems maybe that's linked to this is I, I don't think we're seeing yet the uh, the real costs, the costs or the real value in what is the small scale ecological regenerative. Um, and I think we're still externalizing the costs of the centralized um, large scale industrial kind of food agricultural system. Um, and that makes it a very un uneven kind of playing field. Um, and I think it's it's creating a, a tension in, in the system that makes it very difficult for the small scale uh, activities to, to develop and grow. So while we see lots of movements across Europe and we see this kind of upward pressure, I think we're also seeing kind of limits or we're seeing a kind of a, a barrier to how far these movements can develop and grow and how this, smaller scale system can really flourish um, because I think we still have this externalization of costs in the alternative system. Um, and I think until we address that, it's, it's really a, a very systemic issue. Uh, until, until we really address that, I think we won't, I think it'll be difficult to see a real breakout uh, in the smaller scale, more ecological food systems that we, that we really need to see now. I mean, not, for various reasons, um, uh, you know, for, we've got a climate crisis, we've got a biodiversity crisis, um, we've got health crisis in some degree, to some degree as well. So for all these reasons, I think we really need to start recognizing these costs to society and putting a greater value on the kind of enterprise that Brindusha is, is developing and, and with many other people across Europe. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for your for insightful question. And thank you also, Brandusha, for being able to be here with, you know, all the electricity kits and so, so other problems. Uh, finally, I'm going to go for Mauricio, Brian. Thank you, Mauricio, for being here. Um, Mauricio, you obviously know very well the, the rural and smart innovation ecosystem in Spain. Um, so what do you make of your presentation? And especially, are there other approaches that to foster local and smart development, both in Europe and in Spain, that we, can, we could get inspiration from? Yeah, definitely. Because if we think about it from, even with mentioning the crisis, you know, how crisis hits uh, now, well, it's hitting now in many, in many ways and shapes. But it's a very, you know, common uh, word that we've heard from the, for quite a, a very long time. Um, if we think about uh, from the analyze the social economic imbalances that it could, could be produced, for example, the organization that I represent, the European Crowdfunding Network, does push for alternative finance. How could we imbalance those positionings by using digital tools? in uh, those digital scenarios that could be combined with local actions that could, could be already happening. We, we think about the new paradigms that it's bringing within the different projects and the different presentations that have been uh, doing, that have been uh, occurring today. We're talking about those new paradigms with new scenarios, new rules and new players. What if we look for that strong civic engagement that could change it all, that direct action comes from bottom-up initiatives that really, really could push. Because the challenges are there. You know, sometimes it's about uh, the different actors bring, you know, sort of the, those uh, data, the references, that, that strategies uh, upon it. But it's a real call to action that we have to promote and empower. And it's empower to, em to empower that, and bring the uh, innovative ecosystems is not just about entrepreneurship. It is not just about entrepreneurship. It's about building a strong community that has an holistic, uh, an holistic approach to the challenges that we're facing, which are not really not small, you know. And even there has to be in a statement that we are not living in the rural as a, uh, as a secondary citizenship. 
Okay, we are there present. We are acting, and we are a stronghold for climate change, for energy, uh, uh, for that energy transition that has to occur, for the food sovereignty. We are there. So, even in the financial models that it also was was pointed out, what could you know? What could we do? You know, how could we think about always how the cities are financial capitals? They are the kind of the drivers of, of the economical growth. Yeah, but come on, uh, you know, rural has been there for quite a while, and has proven that it has results. And what if we take that concept of building new mo new models, new financial models, and we create alternatives, and we bring those tools that could be innovative tools for the fundraising part. This is where crowdfunding has been, uh, you know, has, has been proven that because it was uh, it was sort of pushed by the sharing economy or embraced by the sharing economy in the crisis of 2009 has proven as a great tool for when COVID hit, it was an alternative tool to fund different projects and fund different uh, initiatives. And even now with, that we are facing climate change and social entrepreneurship has to be on top of the table on the policy side, especially in the rural areas, uh, come on, it's there. So there's not just crowdfunding that I would like to bring in, but also Jorge was pointing out the, the specific role of the public authorities. We cannot, we have to share the burden. Our communities, entrepreneurs, public authorities in different levels of scale. And what if you use crowdfunding also as an innovative tool for civic engagement through match funding, where public authorities promote a project in which they embrace social entrepreneurship, you know, even with the specific areas or, or key aspects that they want to drive in their strategy and bring in the civic participation by funding, by fundraising, like very old style. We're not talking, talk, allow me this, this symbolic image, you know, we're talking about digitalization of the fundraising tools, but where does it come from? It comes from community finance, that it's always been there for a common good, financing together, working together, getting, you know, like the Sexta Feria in, in, in Asturias, you know, working all together for that public uh, infrastructure or, or common work or the, the commons in itself. And what if we bring it into the digitalized tools that could have a very strong uh, approach to it. And we know of from, from our different research, we've, we are aware there's many organizations that is already pushing it, you know, even the rural areas, so specific as it could be the, in the Catalan Pyrenees with the regional, regional development agency in Catalonia that wants to promote social entrepreneurship driven by young people, that sometimes it's not their direct stakeholders. They don't even ask for the leader funds because maybe they're not entitled to ask for it because their idea is a bit raw and it's not there yet. Maybe they don't have this, the, they feel that it's risky because they don't have the skills, but they're young, they're talented. And you want talent back as, as Rindusha was, was already an example. Bring them to, back to the territory, build the, the, those like cement, you know, like heavy ground, for, for what it is to come. So this is where much funding, you know, and there's a, a lot of information that we could share and we could talk about that connectivity and the engagement and the results of using this more uh, hybrid alternative financing models. So I'll be happy to share. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Mauricio, for your for your response. Uh, I'm sure that you, you will have a lot of questions to respond in the debate part. <laughs> um, finally, we it seems like we have a bit of time for one last collective question for our speakers. So, um, Gianluca, Imon, and Mauricio, from your organization point of view. Um, what are the policy gaps at the EU level, but also at the national level in relation to smart, green and digital innovation? That's my question for you. And uh, maybe we can start in the same um, pattern. So maybe Yaluka and then Imon and finally Mauricio. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leticia. Uh, yes, actually, uh, this process uh, uh, needs a lot of direction, in my view. 
because uh, uh, my uh, and our experience in our project, the ZIRA and the, 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 the new Codex project, is that uh, uh, digitalization cannot be left to the markets because markets bring to a digital divide and uh, uh, let's say empower uh, those who uh, let's say have uh, uh, more capacity. So th those who have the technology, those who have the capital and uh, sometimes uh, weaker groups and weaker territories are uh, disregarded. So this means that uh, uh, there is need for direction and at the same time, uh, uh, we need uh, uh, experimentation. So the examples that have uh, uh, been uh, brought uh, here today are really uh, extremely interesting example of something that needs to, uh, let's say, to define better the concept, to frame better, uh, let's say, the intervention, uh, and at the same time, they have to set up uh, uh, policy measures that can be applied. So uh, today we have learned, for example, this issue of crowdfunding in, uh, in a linking, in a linkage with the public administration. Sometimes we know that public administration don't have much leadership in this because they are very bureaucratic. So funds are there, but... Uh, nobody has the capacity to lead a process that uh, requires uh, integration. So I think that uh, the, the main messages to uh, policymakers is to identify uh, actors that can orchestrate digitalization in rural areas. And they work specifically on rural areas and they understand how rural areas uh, are uh, shaped because we have seen that there are a lot of informal activity. There is a lot of need of social capital, young people, uh, reorganization of the uh, way of living, a way of uh, working, uh, of services, of goods, etc. And this needs experimentation, but also a strong direction. And uh, at the same time, we know that uh, given that uh, digital solutions in, uh, let's say, in rural areas uh, are a mix of uh, uh, different types of things, handsets, uh, infrastructures, uh, services, uh, uh, platforms, etc. And so we really have to understand what is the context, uh, who is going to use uh, these specific solutions, uh, and uh, uh, understand also the role of uh, uh, intermediary bodies that sometimes, for example, extension services uh, or centers for entrepreneurship, as I said before, so they can have a crucial a role on this regard. But first of all, as I said before, it is important that uh, communities um, learn to frame their problems, define priorities, and set clear strategy. Because with them, they can go to funders, they can go to policymakers, they can go to, uh, let's say, to other uh, population groups and uh, create alliances and get their, uh, let's say, ideas funded and supported. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca. Uh, Iman? Thanks, Adesha. I'll try to be brief. Um, yeah, and I'll speak probably more about the, the green transition rather than the digital aspects. Um, for me, there are kind of three main issues in terms of, of the policy environment. Uh, I think the first thing is that we need to create space for civic participation. Um, and when I say space, I mean space in terms of time. I think we need to look more seriously at uh, how, how we value people's time. Uh, and if we want people to spend all their time on economic activities or some of their time also on civic activities. And I think we need to 
to build our, our kind of policy environment around that and make space for civic engagement in, in people's lives. I think we also need to look at physical space, how we design communities, how we create space to build communities and build engagement uh, and interaction at the community level. Um, and I think we, we need to look at how we support that civic space. I think we need to have the potential for convening, uh, for professional support, bring communities together to convene community dialogues, conversations, activities, uh, and to create an inclusive space for engagement at the local, at the sub-local level. Um, I think too much of our focus towards citizens and, and towards communities is about information and about awareness raising. And I think we need to shift that to a space also that allows for discussion, interpretation, and, and action at community level. The second thing I would say is accessible funding. Um, I think we need to recognize the voluntary nature of community level activity uh, and to keep that in mind in terms of, of the provision of, of public, public funding for this kind of, to support community level activity. So in that regard, I think we need to remove barriers. I think we need to, you know, if, if we get a, a community uh, that are cohesive, that are motivated, to, to act and, and to build something locally, why would we want to put, why would we want them to compete in order to access grant funding or, or whatever kind of funding they access uh, and to put other barriers in the way, such as co-funding, bureaucratic barriers that often are a step too far, particularly for communities and community initiatives at a very early stage. So I think we need to look at that and also to, to build trust between public authorities and, and community level initiatives. And one way to do that is, is accessible funding. And the third thing I would say is, is to include communities as policy development partners. So I think in order to do that, I think we need to provide uh, an accessible and inclusive way to uh, allow communities communities to engage in policy development at all levels, at the local level, regional, national, and EU level. Um, and for that to happen, I think we need to support networking and organizational development at those levels. Um, we need to allow small scale local community level activities to organize at other scales so that they can engage with policy development processes. Um, and I think that's something we're missing uh, across the board, really, at all levels. So, yeah, those three areas with which I would prioritize. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. And finally, Mauricio. Thanks very much, you. Uh, once again, uh, Iman, you've put, you've set my 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 <laughs> my positioning. So we're talking about local engagement. We're talking about public authorities, strategies, actions for the funding side. Sometimes. As you know, Gianluca was saying, maybe they're not so active and they're a bit more low, or they have the responsibility of doing things right. But you know, combining that part civic participation or the that community engagement, it's crucial. And this is where match funding really comes in very strong, because if we think about how to combine the agility of the digital world, the cyberspace does not does not understand of borders. This is where even the new regulation for the for crowdfunding for those that you don't know it's happening already. Uh, November twenty of of this year, it's going to be fully in place. The same uh, game um, rules of the game for every member state in the financial uh, crowdfunding side. Because for those that you may not know, crowdfunding is about donation, crowdfunding rewards, so think in exchange, but also financial tools as lending or investment. But we all don't understand that. But what happens with this relationship with the rural? This is where pan-European investments could happen in the rural areas. Local uh, initiatives that already have grassroots uh, proposals that are financed could get support by fund get funded, you know, or extra funding from a local authority or regional authority with EU funds as structural funds. They are they are there in 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 use and. You could promote much funding with your authorities. You could work together with your communities to embrace those challenges that we're facing. 
you know, and even sustainability. But if energy communities were built around the, the different countries, in different rural areas, decentralizing the power of 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 the economic you know power of cities and work as nodes as that network that we was mentioning it's already there with with the internet and the digitalization and the participation and we need uh, those engagements for this for the, for the action concrete actions in the policy side Our advocacy comes in what if you know the decision making comes from the, the communities around it or the community that support it and let me put you an example Okay, what, what if a nonprofit organization in rural Spain, in Extremadura, really hard, has 900 inhabitants, okay, and they want to develop an energy community for the school, for the public school, okay, and it's very expensive for what it is, and it's very expensive for a local community, but what if they went for a crowdfunding campaign, okay, and that 900 inhabitants become over 8,000 people that got to see the project, and they supported the projects even over their funding needs. Even companies participated on that, that same engagement to create a small energy community in a public school with a very concrete focus. And this is, you know, could be, it could be a global company working in, in a very local and remote area. This is where things could happen if we, we open ourselves to that possibilities. It's not smarter the tool that we use, it's what we do with it, what matters. And technology, it is uh, one of those tools that could be very, very helpful in the challenges that we're facing with rural, rural development. Thank you. Thank you, Mauricio. And now I'm going to give the floor to Serafin to the debate session. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm very glad that you know, you've been very, very to the point and, and, and clear, all of you. Uh, I'm also glad that many people have been interacting in the chat. So there's a number of documents uh, that complement not just what the speakers have said, but also your own ideas. Uh, we're producing in a couple of weeks, we'll send you all a summary of the, the meeting. So we'll actually include also this additional evidence because we are here to generate community and debate, not just to hear presentations. So very much for that. I I would like to come back to um, to, Diana, um, to Daniela, sorry, to Daniela Diana Antonio from FAO. Because of a question from our colleague uh, Alistair, who says I, I take the chance to say hello, about how how the tool will work in practice. So maybe you can actually, uh, in order to encourage people to use it uh, already, uh, whether you would like to to do some uh, additional explanation how it can work in practice. But also on the practical side, we'll become very keen to hear whether uh, what's the waging you are applying to the tool. You're just basically as a convention, you know, equal weighting for the three dimensions of that you're analyzing. Or there's some more sophisticated thinking about that. Just to, to for for interest to know what's the the way in that is used. So I don't know if Daniela is still uh, around, but maybe you'd like to. Yes, I am. Sir. Oh yeah, perfect. So go ahead, please. Thank you very much, and thanks to everybody for their interest. I was following up with many that have reached out also with direct messages to learn more about the tool. So at the link that I shared, there is a simplified tool that comprises these seventeen quantitative questions without the qualitative. So it's a sneak peek on the tool. And uh, if you fill it out, if you fill out the form online, and if you insert your email, you will receive an automated email back with uh, the final readiness score and uh, also the performance in the three different dimensions and some notes on what it means. So if you score this Sprouting. If the village you have assessed scored as sprouting or growing, we give you some insights on what it means and what you can do. Um, so this is about the form online that is available at the moment. It's a preview. And soon in our website, I will now post the link also of our website again, um, we will make available the full tool so everybody can use it online no need to insert email the final readiness score will be generated in an online web page to give some more practical insights who can use it we believe it can be used by a variety of actors you know from our perspectives is first of all a tool for ourselves to compare different villages how they do um, and um, to select the villages we are going to assist in a country as we need an objective manner 
to select the village to assist um, and to prepare for the next steps. But as I said, we believe it's a tool that anybody can use, also local actors themselves, to self-assess their readiness and to identify their strengths and their weaknesses so they can better tailor their smart village, digital village strategy, leveraging strengths and tackling the challenges and weaknesses that they face. Um, did I answer all the questions that you had, Seraphine? There might have been something unanswered. Uh, um, I... But yes, oh, the final point. Oh, the full methodology will be available in a publication that will be released in the coming months. It's a, a publication that was um, uh, drafted with ADL. And uh, yes, so um, keep monitoring our website and I'm sure there will be also some email promotion from ADL to the different participants and we will have the chance to have a dedicated event. So this publication will provide full overview on the methodologies for readiness assessment, as well as the other conceptual approaches and methodological tools that we develop. Um, this means a methodology for DVI twinning, so for establishing relationships between villages that are undergoing a smart village, digital village transformation process, and a step-by-step -step approach, as well as several case studies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Daniela. Definitely, we'll be circulating it uh, as soon as uh, as available. Uh, so, thank, um, may, I, I just going through the the questions already been posed already in the chat. So maybe uh, maybe Jorge would like to to briefly comment, given the time. Uh, you know, the the is territorial rural inteligente, intelligent rural territory. Uh, whether you think uh, you have can be used uh, for the to to support the little CLD approach. Or what you think is not compatible, or if you think that is compatible, what are the things you need to be aware? You know, it's just a very initial assessment uh, on that. Uh, thank you. So I, I think that the leader groups are the, the 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 essential tool for the for the rural development. So, uh, but maybe they need, uh, yes, they need to to actualize the, their vision of the of what is possible. Uh, in the innovation areas, uh, we find that uh, sometimes the the leader groups, uh, so they are very uh, how to say. They have to put their force in the administrative uh, tasks. So many times they have no time to think about what uh, the new technologies uh, can offer in this uh, process of uh, digital and green uh, transition of the rural areas. But uh, obviously the the, the leader groups are, they, they, in, in our model, they should be the, the innovation and ent entrepreneurship uh, center of the, of the comarcas, of the, of the rural areas, obviously. Now, I would like to, to point that, to remark that uh, this question of, so the best practices, like, for example, uh, cooperatives uh, to produce uh, uh, renewable energies, or the, or for, for example, the, the, uh, see the cooperatives or associations to, 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 to share uh, Wi-Fi connections as we have in, in Catalonia. No? So, and other, so um, ecological uh, farming, all these best practices, I think that it's necessary to link them to the general uh, goal of the, of, of the, of this kind of projects because mm, every every best practice uh, by itself cannot uh, is not able to 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 renew the, the 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 rural areas so they have to be linked with with other with other uh, other spaces or other projects other actuations and uh, so that's why we, we, we talk about models, about uh, planning with a holistic model of approach. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe 
because I, I thank you for all the interaction in this chat uh, section. So I'm busy going through that and just collect, selecting a few a few questions. And I see Brindusha has been actually asked about uh, a number of difficulties and so on. Maybe if, if she, she's still with us, uh, maybe she could uh, comment what she said in the chat about uh, you know the innovation she's trying to do, the great innovation she's trying to do in a very local context in, in her in her community in Romania. There's actually the EU rules and the EU programs don't actually facilitate that. Actually, sometimes make it more difficult, impossible. As I hear, there is some uh, policy experts from the Commission and other institutions here listening with us. Maybe it's a chance coming from the ground, if Rindus is around, to to voice what are the problems in terms of actually getting you support for the. Uh, small scale uh, agriculture that you are developing. I don't know if you can hear us. Yes, can you hear me? Go ahead, yes. Okay, I will whisper because uh, baby is sleeping. Um, so the criteria to, um, to gather those points um, to, to have a successful um, application for, uh, for example, setting up uh, young farmers um are very not matched to reality <laughs> so we never managed to gather uh, enough points so that our application is successful that's the the thing so uh, they uh, of course these are nationally established but uh, um broadly uh, they are at european level and then each country uh, picks and chooses which um criteria are there to um, calculate the number of points for a certain application, but for us, it's really, for example, if you if you uh, rent uh, from more than one person, one owner, then you have more points. Then I need to uh, read. To, I need to find another piece of land to rent. This is yeah, <laughs> a bit over what I can do at the moment with the resources just to qualify for that or um, uh, the type of crops that you uh, that you have in place. For example, now we have alfalfa, uh, just to manage to kick kickstart the ecology there. Um, and yeah, that is not so valuable. Um, and then the project is not, uh, doesn't have those, um, that economic unit um, to be qualified. So that's the thing, we're not, super small so we're not like subsistence level but they're not big enough or i don't know mm, fit enough according to those criteria um to qualify and time is running out uh, we are yeah we have a few more years until 40 that's another <laughs> barrier um to consider like why why is the limit of age of 40 for uh, setting up young farmers and all these things that um unfortunately uh keep us in a, on a on a treadmill let's say so we um now and again we need to seek out um income outside the farm and this really takes um makes the time to implement our dream project and to become a model ourselves and to invite new people to come join and learn with us and build together uh, makes it even longer and longer Thank you. I hope I hope that was uh, easy to understand. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, that's great. I think uh, we have covered uh, most of the questions raised in the chat. So thank you for that. There will be a mention to rural pact in a moment as well. Uh, but I think we're gonna leave it there to be uh, as we promised. We didn't want to take you whole morning. We wanted something that is quick, effective, and comprehensive. I think we have done. We have seen three different approaches, three different scales as well. Uh, but I think they are quite complementary in terms of the need of, of evidence, in the need of cooperation, in the need of networking, scalability, uh, and the, the possibility of transferring these experiences to, to other cases. I think that in that respect will be has been a very helpful uh, session. No worry, there's a lot of information here, uh, in addition to the one that provided by the uh, three speakers and the two commentators, so I thank all of them for their availability. In addition to the material that they have set and the links they have provided, there are also, as I say, a number of useful information that has been provided additionally in the chat and by other means. So we'll do a nice, very, very, very brief report, three, four pages maximum, getting all the key elements so you can actually have 
that information together and also a reference to uh, this event. This is, uh, as I mentioned, this uh, European Local Innovation Forum, and particularly these uh, sub, 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 uh, sub elements, uh, the, what we call the thematic community on, on territorial um, development. Uh, we are meeting regularly. This is the second of a series of seminars. There will be more. Uh, we want to make it very interactive. We want to make it uh, interesting and getting people getting to getting to people uh, to contact with each other that not necessarily are used to. And we have seen here, you know, experience from from Romania to to Uzbekistan. So you know, I think we are covering that uh, uh, rather okay today. But we will discussing local development, local innovation uh, through various areas. For instance, we hoped after the summer to do an event. Uh, similar to this one, also learning some of the things about uh, today on urban development, community-led development in urban areas. And there will be other topics. So, you know, there will be varying topics that we hope are interested and actually can bring people together because where we're working is to bring uh, people together outside our usual boxes and hats and, and getting it together. Um, you can subscribe to what we do and the policy thoughts that we do in our IDL monthly newsletter. Also, you can also get updated through events we organize, not just the ones like like the ELIF today, but also the ones we organize in the context of the project, like with some of you here today. Uh, but also some intelligence about the post-27, the future of local development policies in Europe uh, that we are hearing here in the Brussels bubble. Also, I'd like to say, as well that because, uh, as you know, ADIL uh, provides the secretary to the Rural Pact Support Office uh, uh, to all the promotion of the Rural Pact. You have seen, you might have seen the link there in the, the chat because it's possible for any of you to join the Rural Pact actually to bring some of the experiences we are sharing today here also through the Rural Pact because that provides an access to the European uh, institutions of your views, of your expertise about how to actually drive the long-term vision for rural areas of the EU. I think it's a very good opportunity to also link up with what we do. So uh, I would like just to thank all the speakers. Uh, I see we are still a few of them. Um, some people are left already, but uh, maybe my colleagues, you could, we can do a, like a collective picture of all of us before we launch a bit of a quick poll. Okay. So uh, those of you who are uh, can activate the camera, uh, perfect. Maybe we can do now uh, smile, smile uh, picture because uh, I think we're all, all happy to be here together today. So one, two, three, smile, thank you. That will also be in the nice report we will circulate for uh, for you, for your awareness. Uh, so thank you very much for that. I believe we have launched, uh, we'll launch now a, a poll, just satisfaction poll to think what do you think uh, this event has gone. Um, how whether you find these events interesting, and as you uh, as as you log out, uh, you are more welcome to to fill that in. That help us understand uh, how 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 these events are useful or not. Of course, there is a elif at adl .eu email. You can always write to us. You have suggestions about the potential speakers, suggestions to make the session more interactive. You absolutely uh, feel free to contact. Uh, through Elif uh, email account or to any of us via email or social media, we are here to actually share and discuss. And for us, it's a bit of getting out of the day to day and doing this sort of thing out of the box. So very much want to make sure this is useful and we can improve. Um, so as I say, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. As I say, if you could uh, thank the speakers in particular, and I uh, we will send you a report uh, very soon. So thank you for that. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.